The Lord be with you. Good job, everybody. Welcome to worship here at Centenary United Methodist Church. I'm so glad that you all came, even knowing that I would be the one up here. It makes me feel very loved. We have a couple of announcements that we want to uh, bring before us. Uh, fellowship lunches do continue. And the men decided where they were going this week. So this coming Wednesday, they will dine at Dudley's out in Madison Heights, one of my favorite spots. Tell Della I said hello. And the ladies will lunch at Depot Grill downtown on Thursday. Next week, Pastor Michelle will celebrate Holy Communion with us. And so we have that to look forward to. Starting this week, the part two of the study of Revelation will be uh, re-beginning there in the Fellowship Hall on Wednesday at 10 a.m. Are there any other announcements to bring before the body? All right. Then let's enter this time of worship as we are quiet and we welcome the light of Christ. God calls us to worship today. All are invited, the sick, the well, the believer, and the doubter. Wash us, O God, may we be cleansed by your holy love.
be seated. And we join together in our congregational prayer. God, who sets the captives free, we are gathered to meet with you this morning. Open our hearts to the many ways you will speak to us. As you did with the prophets, you call us out of our everyday lives to share your message of love and grace. Challenge us today to look within ourselves so that we may be your disciples. Amen. Father God, we come to you this morning, each of us coming out of our ordinary lives, to this time set apart. Lord, make us aware of your presence. Be with us during this time of worship. Help to prepare our hearts. Help us to be equipped for the mission that you gave us to go out into the world and make disciples. Lord, what an important assignment we have been given. We know that you will be with us. Let us trust in the ways that you will equip us. Lord, we pray for the leadership of our country. It seems as though so much is against us. And yet, in the quiet times, we feel your presence. We see all of the wonderful blessings around us, the beauty of nature, the way that our neighbors step up to help us when a tree falls on our car. Lord, help us to be there for each other, for all of our neighbors, not just the ones that we know. And Lord, we ask your healing blessing upon those in our congregation who need physical healing. My brother Bruce, Marge Wilson, Phyllis Murphy, Sarah Beth Freeman, my buddy Ann Harper, Lorraine Massey, the dear Evelyn West, who will soon celebrate a hundred years, Deborah Freeman, Carmen Huckabee, and Alan Gerdahl. We pray your comfort among those who are isolated and traveling mercies upon all of those who are on the roads and in the air this weekend and bring us safely together again so that we may worship as a family. And now with the confidence of children of God, we pray the prayer that you taught your disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. We'll continue our worship with our time of gifts and offerings, and a message in song with David Williams. Take the world, but give me Jesus. All its joys are but a name. But his love abideth ever. Through the eternal years the same. Know the height and depth of mercy, O the length and breadth of love, O the fullness of redemption, Pledged in endless. 
this life above. Take this world, but give me Jesus, sweetest comfort of my soul. With my Savior watching o'er me, I can sing the billows roll. Know the height and depth of mercy, oh, the length and breadth of love. Oh, the fullness of redemption, pledged in endless life above. Take the world, but give me Jesus. Let me view his constant smile. Then throughout my pilgrim journey, light will cheer me all the while. Know the height and depth of mercy, oh, the length and breadth of love. Oh, the fullness of redemption, pledged in endless life above. Take the world, but give me Jesus. In his cross my trust will be. Then through clearer, brighter vision, face to face, my Lord, I see. Know the height and depth of mercy, all oh, the length and breadth of love. Oh, the fullness of redemption, pledged in endless life above. Mighty God, we have read of the prophets of old and how your power was often made known to them in small gestures or in a still small voice. We bring our gifts to you this day, confessing that we have often missed or dismissed your miracles because they did not present themselves in a dramatic, startling event, or grand transformations. Give us eyes that are constantly on the lookout for the small and subtle ways you make your power and presence, love and mercy known to us. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. We'll sing the next hymn through two times.
you may be seated, and Turner will come and read our scripture lesson. Second Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man and in high favor with his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man, though a mighty warrior, suffered a skin disease. Now the Aramians, one of their, on one of their raids, had taken a young girl captive from the land of Israel. She had served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my lord were the prophet who is in Samariah, he would cure him of his skin disease. So Naaman went in and told his lord just what the girl from the land of Israel had said. And the king of Aram said, Go then, and I will send along a letter to the king of Israel. He went, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of garments. He brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent you my servant Naaman, that you may cure him of his skin disease, oh, that you may cure him of his skin disease. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to give death or life? that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his skin disease? Just look and see how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard what the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent a message to the king. Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me, that he may learn that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and halted at the entrance of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go, wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became angry and went away, saying, I thought that for me he would have surely come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, and would wave his hand over the spot and cure the skin disease. Are not Abana and Farpar the rivers of Damascus? better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? He turned and went away in rage, but his servants approached him and said, Father, if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, would you not have done it? How much more when, he said, when all he said to you was, Wash and be clean. So he went down and immersed himself seven times in the Jordan, According to the word of the man of God, his flesh was restored like flesh of a young boy, and he was clean. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Turner. I, for a number of years, I taught the youth class, and I always said, if you get up there and you read a word or a name, everyone will assume, if you say it with confidence, that your pronunciation is the right one. Turner and I will disagree slightly on the pronunciation. I say Naaman. He's got Naaman. Peggy would probably be able to give us the Jewish pronunciation. Thank you, Peggy. So, but otherwise, I'm going to end up flip-flopping back and forth between my pronunciation and all the others. So, we're going to talk today about this story of Naaman and his healing. This sounds like a script for a great movie. What an incredible cast of characters. We have a mighty military leader, kings of nations, a prophet, and a handful of servants all playing out these scenes of power and shame and need and hope and disappointment and transformation. I can almost cast the film in my mind. Can't you just see The Rock as Naaman? <laughs> I can see him confidently striding into the courts from battle. Naaman is a powerful man. 
the scripture tells us that he is the commander of the armies of Aram. The king holds him in high esteem because it is through his conquests that the kingdom of Aram has become so powerful. It is through him that God has given victory to the armies of Aram. This is a guy who can write his own ticket. He can have anything that he wants. Well, except for one thing. Amon has a terrible skin disease. And not only did that cause him to suffer physically, it was also socially unacceptable. In most of the ancient world, leprosy was associated with uncleanness. It's ironic that despite Naaman's strength and success, in the eyes of his contemporaries, he was dying as an unclean man. Leviticus 13 gives instructions that the priest was to quarantine a suspected leper for seven days and then re-examine the person to determine if the disease was indeed leprosy. If it wasn't, then the person's garments were washed and he or she was pronounced clean. But if the disease proved to be leprosy, the quarantine process was repeated. And if a leper failed the second trial, he or she was pronounced unclean and was exiled from their community. Now, leprosy is an infectious disease caused by a bacteria. It can affect your eyes, your skin, mucous membranes, and nerves, causing disfiguring sores and nerve damage. And yes, it still exists today, affecting about 200,000 people globally. In its final stages, it can cause paralysis, vision loss, and permanent damage to the hands and feet. So Naaman is desperate to be healed. I am sure that he has tried everything in his power, but new hope comes from an unexpected source. On one of the raiding expeditions against Israel, the army of Aram had captured a young girl, as she was in the service of Naaman's wife. I have casted a young Mara Wilson, who played Matilda, in the role, as she even has that lisp that she had in Mrs. Doubtfire. Now, I can hardly imagine what it would be like to be seized as a young child, dragged to a different land, and enslaved. But she's developed a relationship with Naaman's wife and is moved by the suffering of her mistress's husband. She has compassion for him. And she remembers a prophet in Samaria who could heal Naaman. And what courage it took for this young girl to even make the suggestion. And then Naaman's wife had to have the courage to pass it on. And this big, powerful, mighty military man is desperate enough to try anything. So he goes to see his master, the king. And the king immediately gets on board and agrees to send a letter to the king of Israel along with Naaman. And he sets out, and he takes with him some lavish offerings to deliver the letter to the king. And that letter is not received well. I picture Danny DeVito pacing up and down the throne room, running his hands through his hair and muttering, Who am I to heal anybody? This is crazy! It's a trap. That's what it is. It's a trap. He's trying to trick me into another war. What am I supposed to do? But not far away, word is getting to Elisha about the visitor to the kingdom. Sir Alec Guinness of Obi-Wan, Elisha, calmly sends word to the king. I got this. Send him over and he'll know that there's a prophet in Israel. And so... Naaman and his whole entourage saddle up and they proceed to Elisha's place. Now, remember that Naaman is not the kind of guy who is going to arrive anywhere quietly. He is traveling with 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and 10 sets of clothes. 
and he doesn't have an SUV to haul all that in. So you know he's got a posse of assistants, and each of them is important enough that they all have assistants as well. The whole group rolls up to the place where Elisha lives. Now, in my mind, it's a cave on Tatooine, but probably not, because there is a door to knock on. And a guy comes out. But it isn't the prophet. It's a servant with a message. Go dip yourself in the river seven times and you'll be healed. And Naaman loses it. This is not how he saw this happening. This is a guy who is used to having people obey his orders And he not only gets told what to do, but the prophet doesn't even have the decency to come out himself. This lack of respect is mind-blowing. Not too long ago, I was part of a team monitoring an agency to determine if they are properly using HUD's money. Since the grant is several hundred thousand dollars to our community to support people exiting homelessness, It's a big darn deal. I arrived with another member of the monitoring committee, as she is a Naaman in this city, the grants administrator for the city of Lynchburg. And the head of the agency that we were visiting, she didn't show. Now, I get not showing up for me, but seriously, what? So I kind of get how Naaman's group felt, a little stunned and incredulous. Naaman himself, he is ticked off. He was expecting pomp and circumstance. He wanted the prophet to come out and wave his hands and say, be healed. And instead, he sends a servant out to tell me to go and dip in the muddy Jordan River, in this inferior river in this inferior country. I'll go home and wash in the rivers there and at least I'll get clean, he says. Can you just picture the ranting and arm waving and stomping about? And then one of his servants raises a finger and says, um, boss, can I ask you a question? Now there is another servant full of courage to face a ranting rock with a suggestion. Now, I note that the servant who catches up with Naaman addresses him as father. Now, I don't think he was literally Naaman's son, but I imagine that the circle of people around him that traveled with him would have been made up of usual companions. Remember, he has a highly infectious skin disease that made him ritually unclean to be around. The team around him must be very dedicated to serve him. It's a tough assignment. At best, you have to go through frequent rituals to allow you to be in society, and at worst, you contract a deadly infectious skin disease. Now, you have traveled with your leader towards what sounds like a miraculous solution to not only his problem, but it sure would make your life easier as well. And because the prophet didn't come out to say certain words or perform some sort of dance, you're going to storm off and give up? Father, if he had asked you to do something difficult, walk a mile on your knees, carry a mule up a mountain, construct a temple out of popsicle sticks, Wouldn't you have done it? Why not give this a try? Now the response could have been anything. He could have been turned away from this elite regiment. Or he could have been dealt a fatal blow from a frustrated soldier who had conquered countless foes. But he didn't. For reasons that we don't entirely know, Naaman relented. He went down to the Jordan and he dipped himself seven times. And you have to wonder, what was going through Naaman's mind each time he submerged into the river? This is ridiculous. Why would this even work? Why am I doing this? 
The Jordan isn't even that great a river. What is the point? Why couldn't Elisha the prophet have been a real solution? Why didn't he at least come with me to watch me or pray or, or call upon his God for me? And each time he dips is another gesture of humble submission. Well, that was number five. Is this going to work? Could it? Six. One to go. Please let this be real. And when he came out of the water the seventh time, it was beyond anything that he could have hoped. His skin was like the skin of a little baby. The pain, the sores, the itching, the suffering, all left behind in the Jordan. Now, Turner's reading today stops there. And as a movie, it would be a good final scene. The rock rising up out of the water, his skin renewed. Little Mara Wilson standing on the banks. Because, of course, in my movie version, she goes along with them. Raising her eyes toward heaven. On a far-off hill, Elisha in his Jedi robes, observing. Fade to black. DeVito was an expensive cameo, so he did not come along for this scene. Another scene and another twist await you in 2 Kings chapter 5. A return to express gratitude and then a sneaky servant looking out for number one. I'll let you read that for yourselves this afternoon. Because we've got to figure out where we are in this story and how it applies to our lives today. Otherwise, it's just a cool story of healing by one of my favorite prophets. In the next chapter of 2 Kings, he makes the head of an axe float. What does it all mean? Who do you identify with most in this passage? The young girl who knew the right person for the job? Naaman, the commander of the army? The king of Aram with his resources? The king of Israel, quick to assign a motive. Elisha, trusting in God's power to heal. Maybe Naaman's servant, encouraging him to go through with the process. Probably a mixture of several. I recognize myself and the servant girl as one who knew a resource to share. And I recognize a lot of you in that role as well. Because this is a congregation of caring and compassionate and helpful people. I get regular calls from people seeking assistance. We, like the servant girl, have limited resources, but we share what we can. Sometimes it's directing a person to another agency, like Interfaith Outreach or Miriam's House or United Way. Or perhaps calling in a food package to our shared resource of the Rivermont Emergency Food Pantry. And I have a lot of knowledge about housing resources. There are times that we know the right person for the job, just like she did, and we can be a signpost pointing towards a healing. Well, maybe there are some of you who have lots of resources, like the King of Aram, he used the power at his disposal to encourage the king of Israel to help Naaman. But even if I don't have a pile of silver or gold, I do have the power to write a letter. I'm often encouraged by agencies to write to my legislators about ways that they could influence change in the lives of the people that they serve. And I bet some of them pace like the king of Israel did, say, this is too big for me. How can I heal this? This isn't in my power. While well, just down the road, the solution was just waiting to be asked. I would love to be Elisha in the story. Axe head floating power is one I think I'd enjoy. Elisha is quietly faithful. And when he hears about this situation that he has the gifts to fix, he says, send him over. He knew that God would equip him. I struggle with that part of Elisha's character. I fear that I would have waited to be specifically asked by the king. 
just hearing the rumor that I was needed would be a pathway for me to say, oh, did you need me? I will say that I completely identify with Elisha's lack of deference to Naaman's status. I have eaten in McDonald's with a state senator. I've sat with the Kiwanis International President at a baseball game. And I quite regularly sit down with a retired lieutenant colonel with enough medals to sink him in the Jordan. I haven't kissed any of their rings. I pretty much approach anyone as, you're a human, I'm a human. If we were all stuck on an elevator, we could get along. But I should probably get a little less joy out of how much Elisha's indifference drove Naaman crazy. Because that wasn't Elisha's motivation. He needed Naaman to stop relying on his vision of how he would be healed and instead open himself up to a different way, a more humbling way. And yes, I identify with the king of Israel's reaction to the request for healing. What? Who? Me? I can't do that. I don't have the time. I don't have the power. I don't have the skills. King of Israel is just having a nice morning cup of coffee and reading the mail, and suddenly there's an impossible request on his desk. Yeah, I would have been thrown by stuff even simpler than that. I like my routine, and when a new task lands unexpectedly, I don't always receive that as an opportunity like I should. You need this now? The king of Israel should have known that there was a prophet, a healing prophet, in his land. He could have seen this as a chance to get on Aram's good side by asking Elisha to fulfill the request. But he either didn't know or didn't think about it. Yes, there's a little of the pacing, hand-wringing desperation of Danny DeVito in my character. I'll work on it. Now Naaman's servant showed the same courage that the little girl did, the courage to speak up. There is something we all can do. Dr. King once said, our lives begin to end the day that we become silent about things that matter. Not too long ago, we had a sign on our marquee that said something very similar. The servant didn't have to speak up, but he did because it mattered. What situations are around us that we can change for the better by speaking up? Will we have the courage? And that brings us to the star of our little movie, What About Naaman Do We See in Ourselves? Okay, I'm not a powerful military commander with the ear of the king. People do not fall over themselves to kiss my ring. But I admit sometimes I might feel like they should. I'm highly intelligent. I read to my kindergarten class. I work crossword puzzles with a Sharpie. There's lots to worship here. Naaman had a humbling condition. We all need humbling sometimes. I've been brought to my knees a few times by situations, a health crisis here or there, job loss, a couple of spectacular car accidents, struggles that you could relate to and probably a few that you couldn't. I watched a couple other pastor sermons on this passage of scripture and one said, I hope that you all have some humbling condition in your lives. I don't think that she meant that she wished leprosy or diabetes or cancer on her congregation. But we all need to have times that we recognize we are not God. We have to stop telling God how to fix our problem. Hey, if you'll just come out of your house and wave your hand over the spot and say the right words, then you can get back to running the universe and I'll be so grateful we have to be humble enough to tear up our script and follow his. 
Now, if you're observant and you have a good memory, you'll recall that the Jordan River is part <clears throat> of another scene in the Bible. Who else dips in the Jordan? Jesus. Jesus, when he is baptized by his cousin John at the beginning of his ministry, <clears throat> he too is transformed by the waters of the Jordan in baptism. He leaves that water and begins the work of teaching the world that true power doesn't come from might. It comes from an unexpected place, a love so great that God humbled himself, came down to live as a human in the person of Jesus so that we could come to know God deeper, that we would be healed not just a physical healing, but healed of all the stuff that keeps us from fully experiencing the relationship that we could have with our Father. It's a great story with a rich cast of characters, and it helps us to have the courage of the servants to share the resources and to point the way toward healing. Let's use our influence in a positive way, like the king of Aram, speaking up for those who need healing and are looking for a way. Help us to avoid the pitfall of the Israelite king and instead look for ways that we might help. Give us the faith of Elisha to know that God will bless us with the gifts that we need to bring about change. Lord, be with us as we face our humbling conditions. Give us hope and the strength to look for healing in all the ways that it's presented, even when it comes from an unexpected direction. I'll close with this short tale of humility and where it led. Christian professor Stuart Blackie of the University of Edinburgh was listening to his students as they presented oral readings. When one young man rose to begin his recitation, he held the book in his wrong hand. The professor thundered, take your book in your right hand and be seated. At this harsh rebuke, the student held up his right arm. He didn't have a right hand. The other students shifted uneasily in their chairs, and for a moment, the professor hesitated. Then he made his way up to the student put his arm around him, and with tears streaming from his eyes, said, I never knew about it. Please, will you forgive me? His humble apology made a lasting impact on that young man. The story was told sometime later in a large gathering of believers, and at the close of the meeting, a man came forward and turned to the crowd and raised his right arm. It ended at the wrist. He said, I was that student. Professor Blackie led me to Christ, but he could have never done it if he had not made wrong right. Let us pray. Father God, help us to see ourselves in the story. Help us to learn from this example, how to have courage and compassion to listen and be humble, to speak up for those who have no voice. Lord, help us to live in community with each other. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll close our worship today with Grace greater than our sin.
if there is righteousness in the heart. There will be in the if there is beauty in the character. There will be in the if there is harmony in the home. There will be order in the nation. And if there is order in the nation. So let it be. Amen.